And in California, dynamic, open, unresolved affirms presence. It affirms what in Indigenous studies we call survivance, which is a term that combines the idea of resistance and survival. Um, Gerald Bisner is an Anishinaabe writer and scholar, and he coined that phrase, but survivance means that we've resisted and survived. And so that uh, dynamic openness also affirms that California remains an active Indigenous space. And there's a lot of really great Native literary scholars. Laura Ferlin is another one of them, and she writes about Indigenous cities and affirms that U.S. cities are always Indigenous spaces. And so when you think about L.A. as an Indigenous space, for example, like so many different possibilities for reading open up. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the English Department's Literature, Language, Culture Dialogue Series. This is hosted on YouTube and podcast. And today we have a guest from the English Department, Lydia Heverling. Lydia, would you mind telling folks a little bit about yourself and where they can find you online? Hi, I'm Lydia. I am a scholar in the English Department, um, Hispanic, Latinx, Ancestry, um, and I work on uh, American Indian, formal and aesthetic innovations in 20th and 21st century literatures. Um, I also work in the funny little world of critical surf studies as well. You can follow me on Twitter if you would like to. It's my first and last name. So Lydia, L-Y-D-I-A, Heberling, H-E-B-E-R-L-I-N-G, just the at Lydia Heberling, and that's the best way to find me. Of course, the English department now has social channels. We'd love for you to follow us there. So Instagram and Twitter are UW underscore E-N-G-L, UW Engel, and then Facebook, the same thing, but no underscore. And it helps the project if you like and subscribe on YouTube, and maybe we'll eventually get our own URL as a department. That's something that it provides for us. And then um, if you're listening to the podcast, reviews on iTunes are really helpful, and it gives us an idea of how audiences are engaging. Um, all right, I hope you all enjoy this week's episode. What did you bring to discuss with us today? I brought a fish, a boat, and a wax cylinder recording. Many of them, actually. Specifically, I brought a grunion, which is a small silver-sided fish about the size of a sardine, and they're local only to Southern California beaches, like between Ventura and maybe Baja California. Um, the boat, more accurately, is called a tiat, and it is the Tongva, which is the tribe indigenous to the Los Angeles region. It's a plank canoe built by the Tongva, so the tiat and its cousin, the Tomo, built by the Chumash communities are the only two plank canoes built by Northern American indigenous communities. And then the wax cylinder recordings. And these are objects that I have built a reading practice around. For the cylinder recordings, you say you develop a reading practice around it. You're saying like you're thinking about this kind of auditory record as a way of like storytelling and autobiography and so on. What does it have to do with what different people in different positions see in the world today? Yeah, great. A wax cylinder recording is an uh, early 20th century recording technology. It was developed just at the end of the 19th century and it became a very popular um, media or, or medium for recording indigenous song and stories in indigenous languages kind of in the era of um, what we call in anthropology salvage anthropology which is just kind of preserving as much of existing indigenous uh, knowledge and language as we could, presuming that indigenous peoples in North America were inevitably going to go extinct. And so wax cylinder recordings became the preferred technology by anthropologists to record language and song for posterity. And it has become used in indigenous communities, originally for people studying indigenous communities, you know, in kind of that anthropological gaze moment where we're like, studying indigenous peoples as objects. Um, but now indigenous communities are, are relearning their own languages because of these technologies and because of these archives of wax cylinders that we have stored in places like UC Berkeley's Museum of Anthropology. I focus on one 
person's recording um, a Yahi man named Ishii. Well, Ishii's not his real name, but a Yahi man we call Ishii. And he recorded five hours and 34 minutes of songs and stories and cultural knowledge. And I'm treating this body of wax cylinders as his autobiography and introducing the question, like, how do we talk about Ishii as a 20th century California Indian storyteller um, or, or writer um, when he's never actually written a text? And so I'm shifting the idea of text from like something that you read and write in a book, right? To like, what do we, what, what happens when we consider this wax cylinder archive a text? Yeah. And what happens if we consider the stories on it an autobiography, you know? So. Like, why is it something that different folks in different positions should engage in? Like, why is it critical now? Because we need to learn how to listen to the communities that we've become very good at silencing. Um, and because we have become very good at silencing particular communities, especially indigenous communities, indigenous um, storytellers have had to find other places to put their stories, <laughs> especially in California. My research is focused almost entirely on California and the indigenous Pacific and California experienced um, violent settler colonialism in the way that the rest of North America has experienced violent settler colonialism, but like particularly extreme because it was three successive waves. It was the Spanish with the missions, and then it was the Mexican government, and then it was the United States all within a 100 year period. And the communities there experienced a near complete you know, wipe out. And so in order to survive the particularly violent like legal policy of genocide in California, um, stories had to be hidden and encoded in different places. And so we're reclaiming archival texts like wax cylinder recordings because the knowledge that Ishii, for example, encodes in those wax cylinder recordings becomes very important for contemporary communities to know. But we have to, we, we don't, these things aren't written in history books because the history books write out the native communities oftentimes. And so as scholars or people who are interested in these stories, you kind of have to get creative. You're like, okay, where are the stories? And the stories are in wax cylinders. And the stories are encoded in the revitalization of a canoe, you know, and they're encoded in the landscape. And so I really focus my research on reading these texts and learning what we can from it. For this next object, can you tell us a little bit about why it's important to talk about it alongside the wax cylinder recordings, what it, what else we can learn from it, etc.? Yeah, so the next object that I have brought to this conversation is the Tongva Tiat and its cousin, the Chumash constructed uh, Tomol. So the Tongva are the indigenous community in the LA region and the Chumash are just north of them. So in the Santa Barbara area, what is now known as the Santa Barbara region. So these are coastal indigenous communities that were pretty severely impacted by the Spanish missions when they were established in the 18th century. And as part of a similar salvage anthropology project at the beginning of the 20th century, anthropologists went around collecting any knowledge about cultural and material practices that they could under the presumption that all the native people were going to disappear forever and we would have to save this knowledge for posterity. And so the few elders who still remembered how to build Tiats and Tomals did tell this one anthropologist, J.P. Harrington, who wrote down so much in the book, Bad Indians, Deborah Miranda writes that that guy would write down the Indian instructions for scratching your ass if you let him, <laughs> like he just wrote down everything, you know? And that ended up being a good thing because these communities have been able to go in and access Harrington's collections and they have the written instructions for rebuilding these plank canoes, um, which again, you know, when you think about canoes in North America, you probably are imagining the dugout canoes, especially up here in the Northwest where we're located, you get these massive cedar trees and you, you construct these dugout canoes. The Coast Salish communities are potlatch communities, which means that they spent their summers kind of pre-contact and early contact days traveling. So summers were all about camping out on the coastal spaces, collecting shellfish and salmon and storing up food for the winter and enjoying, you know, the beautiful coast sailor sea, you know. And so they'd travel, they'd go visit families at different uh, locations. And that was a practice that became banned under 
um, US rule that people couldn't potlatch anymore. And so those journeys stopped and reservations were established, which created static home bases for tribes, which was never originally how tribes operated up here. And so for a long time, people didn't potlatch and people kind of had to stay put. And then in the, in the 80s, they're like, uh, we're going to do this canoe journey thing. And so people brought back the canoeing tradition up here. And so in the 90s, you get the tea out resurgence, which is awesome. Um, and same with the Tomol. And then they have these really cool Thule reed boats that are ocean faring too. Being able to reclaim a material and cultural practice, like being seafaring people, <laughs> which is what they were. These canoes were used to go out into the ocean over to the Channel Islands, um, where these tribes moved around a lot, you know. And so this became very important for reclaiming a sense of cultural knowledge and, and pride, you know. It was kind of an assertive act of like we've survived and we're bringing back some of the old traditions. And so the Tongva community started rebuilding the Tiats in the 1990s. And they have brought, it's really cool, we do um, up here in the Northwest a tribal canoe journey every year in the summertime, usually, not this year with COVID, but they have brought the Tongva Tiat up here to the Northwest to participate in the canoe journey, which is really cool. So it's this really cool moment of trans-Indigenous uh, cultural contact and exchange, which is just when indigenous communities come together and share cultural knowledge. What I'm hearing too, just to make sure I'm following right and digesting correctly, is the first step was setting up accountability and relationships. So you have a relationship with the tribes you're working with and it's, it's, it's something you maintain and on go throughout the research. So you're not just taking what you need. And then you have, um, advisors on the research who represent different communities from indigenous tribes right to kind of hold you accountable as well yeah and i also just kind of want to clarify i'm not doing any sort of significant work in tribal communities in california right now i work with writers and artists primarily and so i just yeah. want to make that distinction that a lot of a lot of who i whose work i'm working on are still living and so it's you know a lot of it is a practice of just being in communication and relationship with them as I do the work to honor it. You know, I yeah. was writing about um, this woman, this really cool Ahashaman and Tongva um, writer, L. Frank. And I was writing about some of the columns that she produces for news from Native California. I was like, well, I totally read it this way. And it's so cool. And she goes, no, those are superhero comics. And I just was like, <laughs> you know and so I had to work that into my analysis I'm like well I think it's valid to say here's what I see as a literary work you know and in conversation with her what does it mean to also position these as superhero comics and like how does that then restructure the way that you engage it and so it, it becomes a more collective and collaborative form of analysis that way it's just yeah we were we had that conversation literally standing over her tiat canoe which i was helping her sand that day so i'm like sanding her canoe for her and i'm like no the thing that you write it looks like a tiat and she goes no it's a superhero comic so we're like sanding her boat and having this conversation thinking about how um so much of literature studies is about like the critic scholar um having the final say because it's all about how a text is interpreted versus what the author means but that actually violates a lot of marginalized communities art and work and when you're working with living artists and authors you have to kind of rethink that dichotomy and think about like how does my analysis respond to honor and also like be in conversation with the artists themselves. So in Native Literary Studies, it's really important, as I mentioned, to make sure we're reading Indigenous literatures through Indigenous formal and aesthetic traditions. So something that notably Chadwick Allen does is read the poetry of N. Scott Mamaday, he's a Kiowa author, through a tradition of Navajo weaving, for example. And so looks at the formal structure of Navajo weaving patterns, looks at the poetry of Mama Day, and this is a productive way to read the poetry. There's actually a lot of encoded significance in the poetry when you're reading it through this indigenous aesthetic practice. And going back to this kind of like theme of reading practices, like how does the reading practice develop around the canoes? Okay, so reading the Tiat is really great. Um, I think in 
the field of indigenous literary studies, one of the things we're very invested in is a commitment to understanding indigenous forms and aesthetics, as opposed to trying to um, wedge what we're seeing in indigenous narratives into Western genres and forms and things like that. And so I do a similar thing with the Tiat. Um, so how a Tiat is put together, the process of making it, creating it, laying in the abalone design, you know, sewing the sinew structures. Um, and I look at the um, kind of DIY zine type writing of a Tongva writer named Elle Frank. And she has this semi-regular column in the periodical News from Native California called Second Serving. And her second serving structure very much looks like a tea in its formal composition. So I've adapted this practice to think about California literary production. And when I say California literary production, I mean California Indian literary production. Um, and so I, I think with the Tiat um, and with the uh, column that the Tongva and Hashiman writer L. Frank produces for News from Native California, it's a semi-regular column. It's very inconsistent and it's a very DIY kind of zine aesthetic. And so it looks more like a collage than what you would imagine as like a polished um, column in a magazine, for example. And the collage, the way that it's constructed is it's narrow line after narrow line after narrow line. And there's inlaid photographs and other images that she's drawn. And as I was reading this, and as I was thinking with the Tiat, which L. Frank is also participates in building and maintaining, I couldn't help but notice that the structure of second serving looks a lot like the structure of a plank canoe where you've got plank, 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 it's sewn together by little narrative, you know, juxtapositions, and there's images inlaid in the way that you would lay in abalone on the outside of the Tiat structure. And so I found this a very productive comparison to make as she's encoding the structure of a Tiat into this semi-regular column that she writes. And then that becomes very interesting to read because you think about the way that the journal itself travels and connects people. And so in the way that the Tiat travels, it journeys, it voyages, and it connects people because it's a collaborative rowing process, you know? And so you think about the way in which this Tiat uh, column then travels and connects via a reading practice. Just, it's really cool. <laughs> and then like one more layer in this, because this is what, I really love to geek out on is within this kind of Tiat plank canoe structure, which she actually tells me, no, that's not a Tiat, those are Superman comics. And so I also have to then think on that level, like how are these, how are these stories of heroes, you know? Um, but she includes one story about a young Yurok boy, so a boy from a tribe in Northern California who participates in a surfing competition. And she then does this really funny, in a very short space, a very deep dive into like surf aesthetics, but she kind of subverts surfing culture and surfing lingo and the practice of surfing to an, a firm, um, an ancestral indigenous connection to and belonging to the ocean. So just one of these planks is doing that amount of work. third object that I brought to this conversation today was the grunion, which is the small silver-sided fish, um, which is local only to Southern California and Baja California beaches. Um, and I bring this fish to you because it appears in a novel written by, again, the Kiowa author and Scott Mamaday. It's the 1968 novel House Made of Dawn. It's the first novel written by an American Indian to win a Pulitzer Prize. It won the Pulitzer in 1969. In this novel, half of it is set in downtown Los Angeles um, in the 1950s, which is the early period of relocation for um, tribal communities. And um, I'm interested in building this reading practice that I start with the wax cylinders and the tiats that center California knowledges and storytelling traditions. I am interested in asking what happens when a native writer who's not a California Indian writes about California and how do we build on this tradition of aesthetic knowledge 
and read this book through California aesthetic lens. And I think the cool thing about reading the Grunion in this kind of canonical novel, House Made of Dawn, which is not a California Indian novel, you know, written by a California Indian, but it affirms that California Indian knowledges and aesthetic forms can meaningfully intervene on and shape our understanding of a broader world. Mm -hmm.